Okay, good morning. And this is um, the first presentation for geotechnical engineering design. So welcome to geotechnical engineering design. This video will be about stability of unsupported slope and is um, a discussion about the theory uh, we use to, to run calculations and to determine safety factors um, in terms of stability of slopes. So in the first place, the first question we, we have to ask to ourselves is what is an slope stability problem? So for example, we have in here in the middle of nowhere an slope that has failed for some reason, probably after a rain. And the first question after this picture, after this failure in the middle of nowhere is why bother? Who cares about this failure? This happened in nature, of course. The problem is we are surrounded by slopes everywhere, especially in roads, highways, motorways. We have slopes that can fail at any moment. And even when we did, um, we put in place some measures to avoid these failures. For example, in this picture, you see a sudden failure of a slope next to a motorway where there, there were some works to prevent this failure, but even um, being constructed with this uh, with these measures to avoid the failure, the failure has happened, and the damage produces on the roads and the damage and the loss of life is uh, certainly important. The other thing about the slopes is the slopes are linear structures that goes next to the roads or motorways by thousands and thousands of miles or kilometers. So they are centrally very, very important, very important structures and they cause a lot of loss in money and lives. Here we see another example of a catastrophic failure where we see the, the picture, the scenery of the, of the place. Apparently there wasn't any uh, danger, but suddenly this failure has produced the um, sudden close of this, of this uh, motorway and probably producing a lot of uh, loss in, in lives and, um, and goods. This is the case of, um, of a mine, in a mine where people are working, workers are working on a daily basis, and the failure is produced suddenly because in order to exploit the mine, uh, we create artificial slopes that can fail as well. So this is something to take in consideration. And there is a link in here you can see if you want about monitoring um, displacements in the slopes that I found interesting for you to see. A building like this, for example, uh, is an historical case of failure in Sitges in, in Barcelona. It was a, a plant that was in the middle of nowhere again and along this building and suddenly after a, a rain this catastrophic failure was produced just because the soil under the structure has failed. This uh, shows us how important it is to know the way the soil works in terms of mechanical behavior. Because uh, remember that every single load that is applied to the building finally is transmitted to the soil. So if the soil fails, independently of the quality and the good design of the superstructure, the building will fail catastrophically and we are going to lose to lose uh, life and, and goods again, and a lot of money, of course. So these are another picture of the failure that was catastrophic. And this is a scheme where you can see what, what had happened with this building. This building uh, was certainly no massive, but a, a big building. And the failure was produced by a rotational mechanism that has reached the um, strength of the soil producing this um, uh, movement, this rotation, because the self way of the building and maybe because the wind or, or something like this, but no more. So um, the problem here was the catastrophic failure of the soil under the building and not because the, the foundation was bad, but because the soil reached uh, its, um, its strength. Um, you see as well that there is um, 
a rock in here. So probably if the foundation were made using piles and reaching the, the rocks in here and and um, this failure could be uh, avoided, but uh, it's difficult to say at the first instance what was the, the, the problem. But basically, in order to understand the, the importance of the catastrophic failure of the soil, this example is a, is a good example to see. This is another example in a, in a road, in a secondary road, where suddenly the failure is catastrophic, producing damage not only in the slope, but in the road itself. This is in, in Catalonia as well, in Spain. This is another, another case next to a river, where sometimes the presence of water produces a change in the, in the strength of the soil around, and these failures can occur even when the, the designer was sure that the design was, was made perfectly well. So the question now we can ask to ourselves is how we can study this problem because um, as you know um, soil mechanical problems are very complex because the soil is a natural material, it's a, a material that is uh, formed by several particles and it's a mixture of sand, clays and other other materials and water and the content of water changes constantly so Studying the soil is, is certainly difficult. So what we do in, in, in geotechnical engineering every time we need to study a problem, we start doing some experiments at the laboratory. So for example, in here we have set up um, a soil um, where we can see several layers to appreciate in colors the deformation after the application of the load. And for example, you have a building in here at the lab created to study what happened when we increase the loads on the building. And easily you can uh, you can see on the screen that there is a line where the failure appear to be concentrated. And this is a first indication of the mechanism of failure of this of this of this building. There is a rotational mechanism to the right in this side of the structure, a rotational mechanism to the left, and a displacement in these directions to the right and to the left producing a failure concentrated on this line. If we try to reproduce the failure of the building we studied before by a rotational mechanism, we can do it at the lab and we can see in here that the soil was deformed and the rotational mechanism was created, concentrating again the deformation and the stresses, of course, on this line you can see on the screen. Um, Okay, this experiment was uh, applying an eccentric load to produce the rotational mechanism. In the previous example, the load, of course, was centered, and this is the reason why the mechanism is different in essence. Here as well, I wanted to uh, share with you um, an experiment where we identify the failure in the case uh, when we have a tunnel and we apply uh, forces that can correspond to a building next to the next to the location of the tunnel that is being constructed. This kind of failure can occur and they occur actually <clears throat> many times when we are constructing uh, tunnels in reality. And again, we can identify the, the lines where the soil is failing with the concentration of the stresses and the formations. So, but um, in order to study this problem, all these experimental um, experimental studies are not enough because we need to add some theory and we need to add some equations to, to prevent and to design our our buildings and our uh, and the way the soil will will behave under the buildings basically. So how we can study this problem? In the first place, we need to know soil mechanics and. Probably the most important principle in soil mechanics is the principle of effective stress. When we deal with saturated soils, we have to take into account that the presence of water will produce a certain um, water pressure that can be static or can be um, dynamic, depending on the, of the case. But in saturated soils, and considering only hydrostatic water pressure, we can define the effective stress as is uh, defined in this very simple equation. The effective stress sigma prime is equal to the total stress sigma minus the water pressure. This very, very simple principle is extremely powerful as usually happen with simple principles. So uh, this is something that you have to remember and you have to, to take in consideration. 
we are going to see an interpretation of what is the effective stress that is mentioned in, in, in every single book and in every sim simple study in saturated soils. So if we have a portion of soil that is formed by particles and water, that, because this soil is saturated, and we apply an external load that produces an, an external stress, we are going to say that this external stress, sigma in green, is the total stress. If we analyze now a line to analyze the stresses internally, we see that this line cross the water and cross the um, contact interparticles of this sample. So there will be then certain areas in the contact of these particles where we are going to have forces interparticles that will produce stresses. These stresses interparticle are what we call the effective stress. Apart from this surface, we can identify another surface in blue in here. That is the surface on the line we have set up at the beginning where the water is present. On that line, we are going to be, um, this line will be subjected to a pressure, the water pressure, we are going to, to, to call U. And this is uh, a useful interpretation of what is the effective stress, what is the total stress, and what is the water pressure. So here we have a resume of this uh, variable. So we are going to say sigma is the total stress, sigma prime is the effective stress, and U is the water pressure. Um, then, then Carl von Terzani is an English uh, was an English um, engineer that formulated the principle of effective stress in in the 1930s. So this is a principle that lasts for almost a century. And the principle says simple that the deformation of the soil depends exclusively on the changes on effective stress. So when we are facing a problem in geotechnical engineering or in soil mechanics, what matters is the effective stress, not the total stress. In some cases where the water is not present, the total stress is equal to the effective, the effective stress. But anytime we have water involved in a problem, remember that the effective stress is the most important thing to take into account, as not only the most important thing, is the only thing we need to take into account because it's the only stress that produces changes on the soil as deformations, for example, and changes as well on the strength of the soil, as we are going to see in a few moments. So mathematically, this principle um, assume that the solid particles of the soil are um, rigid, so they cannot deform, and the, and the water is incompressible. This is um, a limitation we need to adopt in order to be consistent with the equations, but it's certainly true in, the, in reality because the water is almost incompressible and the particles of the soil are almost, um, almost uh, rigid as well, so we are very close to reality in this case. Here we have expression of soil strength, and this is extremely important because, um, as you saw in the examples before, the soil fails because at certain locations the strength of the soil is, is, is rich and there are concentration of stresses and concentration of strains, but the concentration of the stresses are the reason why the soil fails. All these expressions I am presenting here are in terms of the shear stress, the shear stress that we usually call tau with this uh, Greek letter. And we are not expressing here an equation in terms of tensile stress. We are not uh, expressing the equation in terms of compressive stresses for a simple reason. We know that the soils are very good to take compressive forces because uh, the soil is formed by particles, remember. So if we compress a package of soil, we can compact the soil, and after compactation, we have a very rigid material under compressive forces. We know as well that because the nature of the soil and because the soil is formed by particles, if we apply tensile forces, the soil has very, very poor strength, poor strength, strength against these tensile forces, as is normal to and is logical. In the middle, of compressives and tensile forces, we have the shear forces, and the soil is sometimes good and sometimes not so good taking shear stresses. But the thing is that in every problem in soil mechanics, the shear stresses analysis is crucial because it's the stress that will be rich and will produce the failure 
of the of the soil which is under certain forces for example because uh, a building acting on the soil so we have different cases in soils uh, to, to study this the soil strain for example when we when we say that we are analyzing a problem with clay drain we means that there is certain part of the soil that allow the flow of the water clays when they are saturated they are almost impervious in general um, but when you have a mixture and the soil is not only clay and you have for example layers of clays and layers of, uh, of soils or you have just a mixture a soil that is a mixture of clays soils lines on this sort of material there is certain permeability and in these cases we need to consider as a soil strain an equation that says that the strain is equal to the cohesion of the clay that form the soil plus the effective stress that this soil is experiencing and multiply by the tangent of the angle of internal friction that is a property of the sand or lime that form part of this of this package of soil when we say that we are in the case of clay and drain we mean that the soil is formed by clay exclusively and when the clay is saturated as i said is uh, certainly or may very close uh, impervious in these cases the um, the strength of the soil will depend exclusively on clays and we are going to have just a value we usually call su or cu which is the strength of the clay and this is basically um, the cohesion that the soil the, the clay has and the cohesion provides practically the whole strength in terms of shear stresses when we have a problem where sands are involved and there is no any clay of course we are not going to have any cohesion in reality there is some some cohesion in sands as well depending on the granulometry but we can consider that there is no any cohesion and the strength of the soil in the case of sand is just the effective stress multiplied by the tangent of the angle of internal friction which is the main property for sand in terms of the strength so in here i present all the details about the variables of this equation so the shear strength remember strength is a stress so it's measured in kilonewtons per square meter or newton per square millimeter the cohesion is a stress as well so the same units as the shear strength the effective stress is and a stress as well the um, angle of internal friction is measured usually in degrees but you can use as well the um, uh, radians if you are more comfortable um, the strength of the clay is an uh, when it's undrained is, uh, is as well an, uh, an stress and the units are the, the same and um, basically the shear strength is an stress as well so uh, there is a consistency in the unit in this equation as uh, is necessary to, to do the analysis here uh, there is um, a simple theory of failure because um, we have defined the stress the strength in in a point with the previous equations for example uh, in this equation that is the most general one the shear st strength is equal to the cohesion of the clay present in the package of the soil plus the effective stress multiplied by the tangent of the angle of internal friction and this expression is called uh, the more coulomb theory which is the most probably the most popular theory to analyze uh, failure in soils and what this will represent is we take in consideration a, a, a two-dimensional space where the vertical axis represent the shear stresses and the horizontal axis represent the effective axial stresses and basically is a line it's a line or two lines as you see in the screen which are straight lines because this is an equation of a straight line in this space where the variables are uh, tau and sigma and uh, the cohesion will be this value this um, sorry uh, the value from the original coordinates to the intersection of the line with the vertical axis and, um, and basically the tangent of angular internal friction is the slope of this straight line so what happened in this space this space is, repre is the representation of the state of the stresses at a point of the soil and you see we have the soil um, which is under certain loads we are going to be able to express in this space the 
uh, for example, the horizontal stress and well, the horizontal stress and the vertical stress, let's say, and this will um, form the, the more circle, you know, so we are going to have all the state of the stresses at this point in every direction. And we say that when this more circle is inside of these two lines that represent the limits that represent the failure of the soil, we are in good condition because we are far from failure because the stress of the state that is represented by this circle is far from the areas where the failure is produced. If we increase the loads on the, on the soil, we are going to increase the diameter of the Mohr circle. And in this case, in particular, as I'm showing you right now, the conditions are a little bit worse than before, but we are in good condition yet because we are far from the areas in this space where the failure is produced. If we increase the, the load more and we, at some point, we reach with our circle, these lines that represent the failure, we are in a, a limit condition, and this is the reason why these are usually called limit theory. In this case, because this circle represents all the possible state of stresses on the soil, on a point on the soil, and we have reached these two lines in here, we are in a, in a state where we are about to fail. And this is the representation in this two-dimensional space of stresses of this more coulomb limit theory. Um, we need to, to study as well the types of the slope failure we can we can we can face in this in this uh, uh, in this subject. So in two dimension we can say that the most common failures in or the most common types of the slope uh, failure are the circular one, which is the the one we are going to study in more details after, the non-circular where the the line of failure is not a circle, but is a parabolic function or a logarithmic function or something like this. We have translational slips when we have these uh, rigid uh, layers of soils that make the, the failure more translational than circular because uh, the rigidity of the, of the layer under the, this area where the soil failed. And we have a combination of these two where we have um, an horizontal rigid soil, for example, rock, and we we have producing here this slope, a kind of rotational mechanism, but that is translational in this area where the rock do not allow the rotation. If we go for a three-dimensional analysis of the types of the slope failure, we can say that there is several types, but uh, these are some examples. For example, the plane failure, where we have this uh, and this scheme in here that show what is the idea is just a wedge. Um, and we have after the wedge failure, actually, that is um, have this shape, which is uh, essentially different because it's, it's more localized it's in, in, in an area of the, of the slope. We have the circular failure that in reality is not circular, but it's, there is a surface in here, which is, um, can be uh, spherical or maybe parabolic. And we have these toppling failures as well that can be produced. We are going to concentrate our attention, as I said, in the circular failure, which is related in three dimension to the spherical failure you can see on the screen. So I think we had made a good introduction of, um, of what is a slow stability. And now the question is, or to, to go deeper, how does the soil fails? Still the question to be understood. And we already answered this question. The soil doesn't fail by compression, usually because it's good taking compressive forces. Um, we are not interested in analyzing the tension failure because the soil cannot take tensile forces. So we avoid these kind of forces when we deal with soils. And the shear stress, the shear stresses will be the key for the analysis. And we are going to see an animation now to, to explain the principle. If you remember the building we have analyzed or we, we saw before, and we can represent this building for by this platform where we are applying um, uh, this force. And if we increase the value of the force, sooner or later we are going to produce a line of failure as we study in the lab and laboratory. And if we still increasing, 
the force we are going to produce a failure that in this case is a rotational failure because let's say this this uh, um, this force is eccentric in the same way or sorry I, I forgot to mention that in here is clearly on this line here is where the, the deformation are concentrated and then the stresses the shear stresses will be concentrated producing the failure of this soil in a slope we are going to have the same situation where uh, the, the cell weight of the slope of additional loads applied on the slope will produce a line of failure that can be circular or not circular and if we increase the load we are going to reach the strength of the soil producing a rotational mechanism like this as you can see in the screen where on this line again there is a concentration of deformations and the concentration of shear stresses that will produce the failure so the key uh, mechanism is uh, rotational this is the, the mechanism we are going to study in more details in the exercises and these lines are lines where the deformation is concentrated and then if the concentration the deformation are concentrated the shear stresses will be concentrated as well so this is the kind of mechanism we are going to to study in in more details in the exercises so in 2d what we do is we uh, define um, a circular a circular line failure this is a circle believe me and so we are going to have a center of rotation in here so we are going to need to define or or we should know the location of the center of this portion of the soil that is going to be rotated um, around the point O and we have this line this length in here where we are going to have shear stresses that basically we try to keep the the slope in equilibrium so the analysis in a in a very simple case where we, we don't have any other load than the self weight of the of the slope the only forces that are fighting one to each other are the cell weight of the slope that is trying to 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 produce the failure uh, with a moment around the point o if this is the line where the soil will fail in the because the excessive loads and the this um, moment produced by the say wells is a um, disturbing moment you can call it and there is against this moment another moment produced by the strength of the soil and these stresses that are forces when we multiply this stress by the length of this line and this negative moment produced by the the shear stresses the shear stresses that are the strength try to stabilize the the failure of this slope producing a restoring moment we call so in this very simple analysis it's simple to see that the mechanism when we consider the rotational mechanism it's extremely simple because we have forces producing a disturbing moment and we have forces internal forces producing a restoring moment that we need to an analyze in order to see where we are in terms of safety factors so this is um, all for this introduction thank you very much for watching